Italy, 1918. A young friar has a vision of the crucifixion as beams of light pierce his feet and hands. Germany, 1952. A young woman falls into a trance and blood begins to pour from her eyes. England, 1992. A widow discovers blisters on her palms that soon turn into open, bleeding wounds. These are but three examples of a mystical phenomenon that has captured the imaginations of thousands for almost 800 years. Some claim it is the physical incarnation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It is stigmata marked for life. According to the Bible, a crowd gathered to watch the flogging of an accused heretic named Jesus. They cheered as he was whipped by Roman soldiers until the flesh was torn from his back. A crown of thorns was braided for his head, and a heavy beam was placed on his weakened shoulders before he was led away to be crucified. Jesus was nailed to the cross with spikes driven through both his hands and feet. Just before sundown, he took his last breath and died. With the Sabbath upon them, Joseph of Arimathea asked to take down Jesus' body. But first, a Roman soldier pierced his side to make sure he was dead. The human suffering of Christ was over. But for some devout, the pain of his crucifixion would live on not only in their hearts and minds, but also in their bodies. The stigmata are the wounds of Jesus, the wounds of crucifixion, and they've appeared on the bodies of certain, usually holy people, on the hands, on the feet, on the side, on the forehead, corresponding to the crown of thorns. Certain chosen or victim souls receive these wounds uh, internally or externally, and they receive them to share, it's called a co-redemptive suffering, in the passion uh, with Christ for the sinners of the world until the end of the age or until the uh, end of the world. From Stigmata's first recorded appearance in the 13th century to today, Hundreds of Christians have claimed to suffer the wounds of Christ, often reliving the crucifixion intimately. Some have shed tears of blood, like a reminiscent of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus uh, shed, shed tears of agony or blood, depending on the interpretation you, you read. Stories of this mystical phenomenon vary from person to person. But, often, wounds appear after entering a trance-like state, otherwise known as religious ecstasy. In 1275, Elizabeth of Herkenrode, a Belgian Cistercian nun, would fall into a trance strike herself on the jaw and pull roughly at her habit, as if being dragged by Roman soldiers. Religious ecstasy, uh, or rapture, I guess one might call it, is just a form of the mystical life. 
you're caught up into a different spiritual dimension like you're one with God or you see God face to face or you experience God's presence very intimately and it doesn't involve any of the senses. To this day, the Vatican rarely discusses stigmata. You won't find a document of a pope or a bishop or a, or a general council about what is a stigmata or who has the stigma to. There's no dogmatic proclamations. There's, there's nothing. Instead, the church turns to local priests and medical experts to determine if the stigmatic's claims are genuine. First, these experts examine the wounds to see if they meet certain criteria. The color of the wounds, usually it's a very bright, fresh red blood. There's no festering, there's no pussing, there's no permanent scarring, nothing. Throughout Stigmata's history, some have faked the wounds for a variety of reasons. Some simply for attention, others for more devious political motives. So experts look for signs of self-inflicted wounds. The wounds are fake if they tend to heal up too quickly. They're just kind of gradually coming on. And then if the person is trying to show both their wounds, trying to create too much sensationalism around themselves, that's not the uh, sign of a true gift of the stigmata. In genuine stigmatic cases, sometimes blood only appears on the surface of the skin. Other times, the wounds are deep and agonizing. When a stigmatist receives the stigmata, they are ex excruciatingly painful, uh, very painful, because the wounds, if they are authentic, are usually very deep, or they'll go all the way through, like the palms and the soles. Bearing the physical pain and mental trauma of Christ's crucifixion, many stigmatics choose to live a solitary life in deep prayer. Stigmatists are very humble, quiet uh, souls that really don't want to uh, expose themselves to others unless God has a plan for that design. If a person goes around flaunting it, oh, oh, you idiots, look how holy I am. Look what God did for me, you morons. That's probably, most probably, not from God or from good faith on the part of the person. Although some stigmatics experience the wounds on a constant basis, others bleed only at certain times often around Easter. By his wounds, we have been healed. In 1992, Heather Woods, a deacon at a small church in England, suddenly discovered blisters on her hands. Within days, they turned into open wounds. And soon, her feet and side began to bleed. It's almost impossible to know exactly how those marks came about. But I do know that on Good Friday, and I was there at the time, she had in her hands and on her feet very vivid, uh, round, red wounds that seeped blood. Although Harrison observed her wounds, and had suspicions about their authenticity, he never got the chance to further his examinations. Very sad to say, not long after all of that, Heather herself died. Her body was found in a, in a river nearby. The coroner investigated her death, wasn't able to say what the cause was. Some people said it was suicide, but there was no proof. So what the full story was, we shall never know.
1224. As the morning of the Feast of the Holy Cross dawned, 42-year-old St. Francis of Assisi knelt in prayer, fervently contemplating Christ's crucifixion. Late in life, when he was praying very intently and he was not well, he'd been sick, he was in pain, he had been suffering, he had been fasting, and he had an amazing vision. And in the course of a vision that was described as if a, a, a seraphim had appeared to him and, and pinged like laser beams into his hands and marks that corresponded to crucifixion, he received the first really well-known case of stigmata. The faithful believed St. Francis had been touched by God and given the ability to heal, read hearts, and even speak to animals. Francis lived with his wounds for only two years before his death in 1226. Immediately, calls for his canonization began. And in 1228, Pope Gregory IX officially declared him a saint. Since the wondrous events of his glorious life are quite well known to us, and since we are fully convinced by reliable witnesses of the many brilliant miracles, we have decreed that he be enrolled in the catalog of saints, worthy of veneration. Although St. Francis is the first documented case of stigmata, some scholars believe that the phenomenon may have a much earlier origin. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians, Paul repeats to a, a totally different audience at a different time that he uh, bears in his body the death of Jesus so that the living Jesus may be manifest to everyone. Now what can that possibly mean other than if he's alluding to something about uh, him suffering along in union with Christ's passion? Most scripture scholars would teach today that that really means he was whipped because the word a stigmata in Greek literally means a tattoo or a brand mark. When St. Francis received the stigmata in the 13th century, Christian Europe was consumed with religious fervor. This was a tradition of a very devout monastic kind of life where there were a lot of convents and monasteries coming up everywhere. New religious orders were sprouting all over. Some believe that this intense devotion may explain why hundreds of people throughout Europe began to claim that they too bore the wounds of Christ. And it was at that time when people sometimes became rather disillusioned with the church itself, some corruption amongst the priests and so on. But through stigmata, it was possible for individuals to display these marks on their body and somehow have this strange or direct access to the body of Christ without the church having directly to sanction it. In 1373, 26-year-old St. Catherine of Siena felt the pain of Christ's crucifixion in her hands and feet, but did not bleed. Thousands of faithful believed Catherine had received the invisible stigmata. A lot of times God will pierce the soul and cleanse the soul first before it breaks outwardly to the skin area for others to see. Catherine may not have bled, but supernatural powers were attributed to her. Her more well-known um, phenomena was to be able to live off of the Blessed Sacrament for seven years. And when her spiritual director told her to stop and to assist and eat normal, she got sicker and sicker and nearly, nearly died. Catherine's confessor and biographer the blessed Raymond of Capua wrote of her holiness. 
I can see quite seriously that she is full of the spirit of prophecy and that the Holy Spirit speaks in her. Throughout the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, reports of stigmata sprouted all over Europe, particularly in Spain and Portugal. But as the Age of Enlightenment dawned, people began to question the validity of these claims. As you move closer to the 15th, 16th centuries of the Middle Ages, the Age of Enlightenment and reason, scientific explosion, revolution, I think all this kind of made us more aware of investigating uh, any claims of uh, miraculous events or, or just uh, uh, miraculous gifts in general uh, because we had more uh, tools at our disposal to investigate these things thoroughly. And so, of course, more, more deliberate hoaxes are going to be revealed. A 16th century Franciscan nun called Magdalena de la Cruz suffered on and off from bleeding feet and hands for 39 years. She was revered by the people as a living saint until she fell ill in 1543. Afraid to die a sinner, Magdalena confessed to lying about her wounds for decades revealing that they were not caused by God, but by the devil. This phenomenon, known as diabolical stigmata, was feared throughout Europe. There was kind of an over-fanaticism on the devil around every corner, and there was the Inquisition going on, and, and there were witches, supposedly, in the church that were operating through Satan, and they were trying to expose them. In 1546, Magdalena was sentenced by the Inquisition to life imprisonment in a Franciscan convent. In the 18th century, Pope Benedict XIV established for the first time some guidelines to help recognize genuine stigmata. There are six or seven different characteristics to define the stigmata according to this document. The most important of these are, number one, the sudden appearance of the wound. Number two, the sudden disappearance without leaving any scars. Number three, the fact that they can stay open for years without getting infected. <coughs> this means they don't have a bad smell, they don't pus, etc. Number four, they have a totally different behavior from normal wounds. Stigmata does not respond to standard medical therapy. By the 19th and 20th centuries, scientists began serious research into the unexplained phenomenon and questioned why most of the cases happened to women. For the first six or seven centuries of the phenomena, uh, it was mostly women who received the mark. Seven women for every one man. There were a lot of convents uh, developing at this time early on in, in the Middle Ages. A lot of women were uh, taking vows of poverty and, and they were living lives of prayer and contemplation. Some believe that this deep devotion, coupled with an assumption that women are more prone to extreme emotion than men, accounts for this seven to one ratio. But others believe there is a deeper significance. Since women could not become priests, stigmata was one way for them to have direct access to God. What we're finding in stigmata are ways by which congregations, who some way are disillusioned with the church around them, being able to reassert their own authority and having access, direct access, to what they believe is so important, and that is the body and blood of Christ. And they can do that directly through themselves without having to go through the mediation and the authority of the priests. 
It was September 20th, 1918. For Padre Pio, it was a day like any other. A day of prayer and reflection. When suddenly, the miraculous happened. Kind of like uh, Francis of Assisi, uh, a seraphim, an angelic creature appeared to him when he was praying before the crucifix in this choir loft. He came down and shot beams of light instantly, spontaneously through his palms, through his feet, through his side. But the pain of stigmata was more excruciating than anything he had endured before. Oh, you just uh, would just grinch in anguish every time he had to walk because it hurt so much to walk. And he was constantly bleeding, and he'd bleed a, a, a cup full of blood from his side wound every day, and they had to change and ba his bandages and his shirt from his side wound and had to rewrap his hands. It's very interesting that lots of stories have been told about him. Um, he went through a lot of very difficult times and wrote long correspondence to his confessors and to other priests and so on, describing the agony that he was going through and the, the way in which he was being attacked by the powers of evil. One time back in the early uh, 60s, in his room, he was beaten by the devil. And during the middle of the night, according to Padre Pio, Mary, the Virgin Mary, who appeared to him many times, put a pillow under his head and comforted him, and the devil fled. When Padre Pio wasn't fighting evil, his followers believed he was armed with certain gifts from God in order to help the faithful. He was a remarkable confessor. People would queue to make their confession to him and believe that he had tremendous insight when, in fact, they saw him eventually. Padre Pio often heard confessions for up to 18 hours a day. 18 hours a day is beyond what ordinarily most priests can handle. I've heard confessions sometimes three and four hours, and at the end of that process, you are wiped out. But 18 hours, and not one day, but for months and years and years, and no complaints. And it was said he had the gift of reading hearts. He could tell you what your, what your sins are, what you've been, what you've been sinning, uh, how you've been sinning, what you've done wrong, specific places, incidences, names. And you could say, I did this and that, and then he would say, but you forgot this and this and those. He had, of course, the gift of healing, and uh, he had the gift of uh, inadia, or inedia, some people refer to it. Now, that's the gift of not uh, eating anything but the Holy Eucharist, surviving on the Eucharist. He could be detected by the odor of sanctity, a sort of sweet smell, rather like roses, that went about with him, and when his presence was there, but he wasn't there physically. He also had the gift of bilocation, which is being in two places at one time. Uh, literally, of course, a person can only be in one place, but it, it's sort of a spiritual reappearance to others at the same time in other places where they actually look like they're bodily appearing to comfort them in times of sorrow, confusion. Well, the church had to do some investigations because thongs of people were starting to come and a cult was developing around him very fast. Whenever there's a new stigmatic, the church approaches it very cautiously. It will get a local bishop to set up an investigating uh, committee, perhaps a committee made up of a doctor and a priest and, and one or two uh, laymen who will come and have a look at the evidence, look at the person, interview them, see what they're up to, uh, see what the religious community around them are up to, and then report back. The stigmatic is assigned a spiritual director who begins simply by asking the stigmatic a number of questions. I would ask is, how are you? How are you feeling? What do you do? As I was listening to the answer on the verbal level of the, the intellectual, the, the conceptual level, I would also be trying to listen to the emotional level. Is she da, 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 like a zombie? Or is she uh, acting? 
oh, is she frenetic? Then I'd ask the, you know, the big question now, do you, you know, I see your hands are bloody or your feet are bloody, may I take a look at them? They need to, they need to be examined uh, for their authenticity to make sure that they, they are, uh, they have all the authentic signs and that they are ongoing and lasting and they don't fester and scar. They will want to find out whether that person is motivated by high motivation or whether there is some form of deliberate uh, deception going on. But even if the alleged stigmatic's motives are pure, the wounds seem authentic, and he or she leads a holy life, the church still will not openly say the wounds are genuine. The church does not authenticate a stigmatist until after they've passed on. They also want to see if this reputation of sanctity carries on after they have moved on because they want the sensationalism around and the, and the cult following around this alleged stigmatist to simmer down among the people and find out if, if there's still uh, fruits to be born from devotion to this saint. In Padre Pio's case, a full investigation began soon after he received his wounds. He underwent psychological as well as medical exams. One doctor who examined Padre Pio's uh, wounds said he, he, could, he could put a flashlight in, in one, of the, one of the wounds and look through the other side of the hand and see the light come clearly through. Another time he could press two uh, fingers together, one on the palm and one on the uh, outer side of the hand and could almost touch his two fingers together. That's how deep the wounds were. And so very painful. Between 1919 and 1920, Padre Pio's wounds were examined by at least three doctors who could find no evidence of self-infliction. However, there was at least one doctor who did find grounds for suspicion. Okay, one medical uh, report said that they could find um, chemicals, particularly of, of iodine, on the, on the wounds, and suggesting you know, that he was doing something to maintain the wounds himself. It was something which threw a strange doubt over the claims that these marks were supernatural. Still, Padre Pio attracted huge crowds to his little village. Hoping to stop this fervor from growing, in 1922, Pope Pius XI ordered him to hold mass only at 5 a.m. He was forbidden to bless the crowds, show his stigmata, or answer letters from his many followers. The church never officially recognized Padre Pio Stigmata, although they never denied his claims either. Eventually, the controversy surrounding the Stigmatic Friar subsided. That is, until his death in 1968. In 1968, after 50 years of suffering the wounds of stigmata, Padre Pio died, and suddenly, the marks of Christ's crucifixion disappeared. There's nothing there anymore, as if the gift that God intended for that soul to have has been utilized, and there's no need for it anymore. The believer said, that is a sign those wounds have been taken back by God. The skeptic said, ah, that shows that the old man, as he got more and more feeble, wasn't able to keep the marks up, and therefore they've healed. Uh, what the explanation is, one will not know. Um, but it's certainly the case that the wounds were not on his body when he died. Dr. Marco Marnielli, a neurophysiologist, studied Padre Pio's psychological profile during a 1987 convention called by Italian Capuchin priests. He ruled out the possibility of a mental illness, but came up with an alternate explanation. Starting from the 1950s, the stigmata were considered a hysterical phenomenon, the consequence of a mental illness. 
Before then, they were seen as a miracle, a phenomenon that could happen only with the direct intervention of God. Now, instead, we see them as psychosomatic, which means that the brain actually creates these sores on the body as a result of some very complicated autosuggestion. In other words, is it the mind trying to say something to the body and the body produces psychosomatic wounds? Some say the psychosomatic theory could explain why Padre Pio's wounds disappeared after he died. For others, the suggestion is preposterous. But still, the question remains, how powerful is the mind? Now, we know the psychosomatic does work. We know that if you're embarrassed, you blush, and blood goes to the face, and uh, it goes red. Now, that's psychosomatic. Studies have shown that stigmata tends to appear after an altered mind state, commonly referred to as ecstasy. There is often an inrush of spirit, an ecstasy, an alteration of consciousness that points toward a higher self, a deeper part of our human nature. This is the final moment of a psychological and emotional phase. The ecstasy is an emotional phenomenon. You feel intense emotion, and in an instant, all this preparation comes together and generates ecstasy. Scientists tested the psychosomatic theory using hypnosis. In England in 1952, Dr. Albert Mason hypnotized a 15-year-old boy in hopes of eliminating the warts that covered his body as the result of a congenital skin disease. After only two sessions, 70% of the warts disappeared. Experts then thought if the mind could make physical wounds go away, perhaps it could create them too. In hypnosis, for example, um, all sorts of bodily changes have been proposed to hypnotized subjects. For example, um, raising a blister. I've seen this done to um, tell the person that they're going to be touched by a hot cigarette or something else, and to watch the person just be touched by something cool, and suddenly there's a blister there. The classic case was told of a man who had rope marks on his, on his arm. When he relived in his own mind the trauma of being tied up as a prisoner, those rope marks became far more vivid and far more conspicuous. As this case emerged in the 1950s, a German woman named Theresa Neumann was attracting worldwide attention when she received the stigmata after a religious vision. Theresa Neumann came from Bavaria. She lived in the middle of the 20th century. She was somebody about whom you could say she had the work. She had stigmata in spades. She had visions, she had ecstasies, she had bleeding eyes, she had wounds that bled. She stayed in bed for long periods of time. She didn't eat for long periods of time. She had strange illnesses. There's pictures of her bleeding profusely from the eyes during her ecstatic moments, her passion ecstasies, when she would relive the whole entire passion narrative week after week after week, hundreds of times throughout her life. Theresa Neumann's story caught the attention of a German psychiatrist who theorized that the same wounds could be exhibited in another individual under hypnosis. Well, there was a German psychiatrist who had uh, working for him um, in his domestic service, a girl, uh, who could be hypnotized very easily, and he tried an experiment. The girl, called Elizabeth Kay, was put under hypnosis and told that she was wearing a crown of thorns. Red welts appeared on her forehead. And soon, Elizabeth Kay had blood running down her face, just as Theresa Neumann had.
Some scientists believe the power of suggestion may explain why an increase in stigmatic cases coincided with a change in religious art in the 13th century. In the early days, there was very little direct representation of the suffering of Christ on the cross. And as time went by, crucifixes, the religious paintings on the walls of the churches became far more realistic and gruesome, and blood was shown dripping from wounds and so on. They came into church, came into worship, um, and looked around and saw the stories from the Bibles painted on the walls, and um, they were very, very powerful. As art depicted Jesus in agony with bleeding wounds, some scientists believe that the images were imprinted in the brain, and the brain simply reproduced them by imitation. Many stigmatics had these wounds that closely resemble a statue or a painting that they have either worshipped or seen a lot. There was an Italian saint, Galgani, who had the shape of wounds on the lash marks on her back that were identical to a painting that was in her church uh, near the altar at which she prayed. So she'd been imprinted with that image to such a degree that she got the same marks. Most Catholic theologians of the past, and I presume of the present, uh, there's not too much literature today on the subject, believe that given a strong imagination, given a strong ability to concentrate, given deep fervor, um, one could start to produce these things on one's body, that is to say, the marks of Christ. On June 16, 2002, more than 400,000 of Padre Pio's loyal followers gathered in St. Peter's Square for his canonization. Less than 40 years after his death, Padre Pio was pronounced a saint by Pope John Paul II. The two men had a brief interaction in the 1960s when the Pope was a young priest in Poland. At that time, he asked Pio to pray for a woman in his church who was dying of cancer. She was miraculously cured, and Padre Pio became even more revered. In the last uh, 20 or 30 years, the cause for him to be canonized reached such a pitch of enthusiasm that he was fast-tracked for canonization. Padre Pio had actually forecast that the present Pope would become Pope one day. From friar to stigmatic to saint, Padre Pio's work continues to be an inspiration to many. Uh, as a result of Padre Pio's ministry, a, a big hospital was set up. More people came to that particular worshipping community than ever before. Thousands, if not millions, now visit every year. He's one of those long-standing Roman Catholic cults of sainthood, which I suppose will survive for many years to come. Although St. Pio is one of the most celebrated stigmatic cases of the 20th century, it was not this phenomenon that ensured his sainthood. The church will never declare that person a saint solely on the fact that they have the stigmata. Even if the stigmata is real and the church says they're, they're credible and worthy of belief, this is true. If all the other uh, ingredients aren't there, if all the other criteria such as the life of heroic virtue and simplicity and faith and love isn't there, if that reputation of sanctity isn't there, uh, if, all, if all of these are, and their writings are consistent and their teachings are consistent with the church, anything flounders there. Just having the stigmata will not grant them canonization because it is not an essential thing of our faith to even believe in the stigmata. There have been more than 320 known stigmatics since St. Francis. And out of those, 62 were beatified or canonized. And we've had a number more in the 20th century, but clearly out of over a billion Catholics that have lived since that time, it's a very rare and extraordinary gift. Although it is rare, Catholics aren't the only ones receiving wounds. 
Protestants, there have been some Anglicans, one or two Baptists, um, but it's very rare that a person who comes from a tradition which doesn't normally uh, concentrate in quite the same way upon the sacrament of the Mass, upon the body of Christ, upon the crucifixion, in the way that, that many Roman Catholics do, to get a stigmatic. Even Muslims receive their own version of stigmata. The ecstatic uh, saint will suddenly erupt with the battle wounds of Muhammad. Today, the number of Christian stigmatics are on the rise throughout the world, having appeared in the United States, England, Australia, Canada, Ireland, Scotland, and even Korea. We're hearing about it leaping up from Peru and Brazil, and there's one reported living stigmatist now from Damascus, Syria. There's one right outside of Munich, Germany, from a close source I know. Really, one can follow the way in which Christianity, particularly Catholic Christianity, has spread around the world, and with it, stigmata has gone as well. It is a symptom of a congregation needing a direct experience of some sort and people want to take back to themselves a religious experience and revalidate their own faith and their own experience in a way that they can do and, and can have control over. While stigmatic cases receive great public attention, the phenomenon actually plays only a small role in Christian theology. The stigmata is a teeny weeny, teeny weeny, to a little, little crumb of the overall teaching of spiritual theology. So, you know, the church leaves it then to spiritual theologians to speculate or uh, think about or make some insights into the questions of phenomena. Stigmata is a fascinating phenomenon, and I think it's important to understand it. They do inspire awe and wonder. And yet at the same time, the skeptics can look at them and say, no, there are natural explanations to these wounds. But what the skeptics can't do is say that those wounds do not exist. And so when it comes to the stigmata and all the claims about the miraculous, there is the evidence in front of both skeptic and believers equally. And from that, the debate can take place.